Good afternoon. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us for the second part mm -hmm. of the first day of this conference, yes. which is proving to be extremely, extremely interesting. Um, we're going into a panel that I know many of you are interested in about restaurants and the restaurant business. And let me introduce our moderator. I mean, you've already uh, seen her in action in the previous panel, uh, telling her vignette and um, her experience on during Sandy. But uh, Roseanne Gold is a very well-known chef, author, journalist, and as we know now, philanthropist. Uh, she worked when she was 23 for uh, Mayor Koch, and her career has been fantastic. She became a consultant chef for Rainbow Room, Windows on the World, and other big restaurants, um, including the Hudson River Club. She uh, is a four-time winner of the James Beer Award, and she's the author of 13 cookbooks, and she writes uh, extensively for uh, newspapers, magazine. Um, we already heard about her work um, after Sandy, and now we'll get to know her more from uh, her other kind of professional uh, endeavors. Uh, so, Roseanne, and she will take care of uh, introducing our fantastic panel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch. Yes? <laughs> okay. And I hope you can hear me okay? All right. So it is a pleasure to be here. But these days, I come twice a week. I am an MFA candidate in poetry here at the New School. So I'm adding that to my list of interesting things to do. I've been a in the New York food world since the mid-1970s as one of the first women to cook in some of the city's most esteemed spots. And then, as I had mentioned, at the age of 23, I became chef to Mayor Koch and lived at Gracie Mansion. I have been both participant and witness to New York's remarkable transformation decade by decade, from the crashing of the stranglehold of continental restaurants to the unexpected status of street food. If once we went out to eat as a quiet getaway, today we crave boisterous communal experiences in underground dining clubs, on rooftop gardens, or lining up in front of a falafel truck. It's 2015, and the creativity quotient has gone through the roof, leaving many of us scratching our heads in search of a simple dish but the $58 veal parmesan at Carbone's may not be what we had in mind. I look at the remarkable group of panelists, each who have changed New York's food world in profound ways, altering our culinary landscape forever. They are a busy bunch and together represent more than 200 years of experience in New York's food world. And we will meet them all in a minute. There's a curious Chinese saying May you live in interesting times. That can be interpreted as either a blessing or a curse. As you survey life in New York today, with $80 million condos that no one seems to live in, $20 bespoke cocktails, with the boom in private concierges and record-setting art auctions, with hotels full and parks and neighborhoods jammed with pedestrians, well then, we're certainly living in interesting times. In our company, we once used several measures to judge how the food business was doing in New York. For example, when the number of oddball ingredients in a cocktail rose to cosmic proportions, or when the price of a slice of pizza was more than a subway ride, or when bottles of wine no one ever heard of got four or five time markups, or when you can only get a reservation at six or 10, or when PR firms became more famous than their clients, when more than one steakhouse opened on the same block, all these were in play when the economy collapsed in 2008. And they're in play again, but 
Except for rising rents, I have to say that business in New York looks pretty good these days, and it doesn't appear that we're confronting any colossal headwinds. Despite all those crystal chandeliers in the new Baccarat Hotel, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of a rational exuberance. But that doesn't mean the business of dining and the way we eat aren't changing, and changing dramatically. Just to cite some examples, many of which I'd like to discuss further with our panel of experts, what can we say about a slab of cauliflower on a plate that costs more than four Big Macs? What can we say about the future of tipping in restaurants? What is the impact of the growing number of food halls opening in New York? How will they affect street life? How are restaurants dealing with rocketing rents? The number of new restaurants does not seem to be declining. And just when we thought small plates were so last decade, the New York Times proclaimed a new era of small plates. Have they rediscovered the wheel, or are they on to something? Today, in a world where people experience life in the palm of their hand and snap a photo of every dish they, before they put it in their mouths, how do we redefine pleasure and expectation? We are a city clamoring for instant gratification. We seem to be alone together, except when we go out to dine. What opportunities and challenges does that present for today? Now, let's meet our panelists. Drew Nipperon is one of America's most celebrated restaurateurs. <laughs> and that's the end of his resume. <laughs> he is the founder of the Myriad Restaurant Group, which operates Tribeca Grill, Nobu New York City, Nobu 57, Nobu London, Nobu Next Door, the new three-star restaurant Batard, and Crush Wine and Spirits. Over a period of 26 years, Drew has opened and operated more than 35 restaurants around the world, which have earned numerous Michelin stars and James Beard awards. Myriad's most recent adventure is the opening of the Daily Burger at Madison Square Garden. Drew's first restaurant, Montrachet, opened in 1985, was groundbreaking. It earned three stars from the New York Times, and it kept that status for 21 years. He opened Tribeca Grill in 1990 with Robert De Niro, and in 1994, also with De Niro, opened Nobu and Rubicon on the West Coast to raves. Myriad is known for its excellent in wine service, earning three coveted grand awards from the Wine Spectator. He is one of the most philanthropic guys in the food biz, and has won the Humanitarian of the Year Award by the James Beer Foundation and by Dorona. He has worked with some of the country's most celebrated chefs, David Boulay, Deborah Ponsack, Paul Liebrandt, and Marcus Glocker, one of Gordon Ramsay's disciples, who is the chef at Drew's new restaurant, Batard. And Drew is now a movie star, and he's in a documentary called A Matter of Taste. Welcome, Drew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Adam Platt. Adam Platt has been New York Magazine's illustrious restaurant critic since 2000. I've had the pleasure of dining out with him and sitting across the table crowded with dishes and emptied glasses of bourbon. Not only is he lots of fun to be with, but incredibly knowledge, no matter what he says. He is the brother of actor Oliver Platt and the father of two daughters who sometimes accompany him on his eating out adventures. We'll find out how life has changed for Adam now that his face has been shown on the cover of New York Magazine. His new 2015 roundup is out now. It's fabulous. And I think you can get it if you subscribe to New York Magazine. Adam does not keep his opinions to himself, and that's why we love him. Welcome, Adam. Next, we have Jacqueline Raposo. We thought it was very important that we had someone under 50 and someone who was a woman. <laughs> Jacqueline Raposo is a freelance writer with regular columns and features in Tasting Table, The Village Voice, Serious Eats, and Plate Magazine. 
She is one of the shining young stars on the food scene and specializes in writing about chefs. She has written hundreds of interviews with, with New York City-based chefs and is currently working on a book amplifying their stories about why they came to New York and why they stayed. Her vibrant blog, Words Food Art, uncovers what's new and meaningful for the city's food-obsessed millennials. I was delighted to be interviewed by Jacqueline a few years ago for Serious Eats. Her blog is beautiful, beautifully written, beautifully photographed. On the homepage, you will find two lines that go to her essence. She says, I like food, I like people, I like people more than food. She has been gluten-free for 20 years. Her website is Words Food Art. Welcome, Jacqueline. David, I'm looking for you. Just skip over it. Oh, no. The wonderful thing is we've all been friends for so many years. I can do this without, but don't want to miss a thing. David Rosengarten is a celebrated food authority, wine writer, cookbook author, and TV chef who is known to millions as a scholar, wine aficionado, and purveyor of the world's best things to eat. He was one of the TV Food Network's first television stars and has hosted more than 2,500 shows, which is incredible. I was David's first guest on a show called TV News and Views, which he co-hosted with Donna Hanover. David, what was the year? Oy, okay, 94. <laughs> David is the author of numerous cookbooks, including two of my favorites, the Dina DeLuca cookbook and Red Wine with Fish, co-written with Josh Wesson. It is a book that changed the way the world thinks about food and wine pairings. David was also the restaurant critic and contributing editor to Gourmet Magazine and wrote the wine column for Newsday. Never mind that he has a doctorate in dramatic literature from Cornell. David has re recently begun importing wines through his company, Golden Ram, and has just relaunched his acclaimed newsletter, The Rosengarten Report. David has brought 50 copies today, and we're going to give them out. How many people here were born in April? <laughs> that, that might just about do it. <laughs> Please come up after our panel, and you will get a copy of The Rosengarten Report. The report has won many awards. It's a quarterly research-driven food publication whose mission is to present the very best of what's available in the world of food and wine, all written by one objective, passionate voice. That's funny. Um, the incomparable David Rosengarten. If you know, want to know all about Japanese knives, great values in Bordeaux, or where to go to in Sicily, I suggest you get this issue. One year subscription, both print and digital, is only $60. Last but not least, Michael Whiteman. I happen to be married to him. <laughs> Michael is the president of the renowned restaurant consulting company Bauman Whiteman and is responsible for creating high profile projects around the globe. Partnering with the legendary restaurateur Joe Baum for almost 30 years, Michael has helped create two of the world's largest grossing restaurants, including the Rainbow Room atop Rockefeller Center and Windows on the World in 1976, and then again in 1996. Together, they developed the world's first three food courts, produced five of New York's three-star restaurants, and masterminded destination dining projects for the Metropolitan and Getty Museums, for Starwood, Taj, and Raffles Hotel groups, including Equinox in Singapore, which was named one of the best hotel dining rooms in the world. Considered the industry's leading food trends pundit, Michael was the founding editor of Nation's Restaurant News and is considered the dean of restaurants consultants. He is known for his yearly food trends report, which Forbes recognized as being this year's best. A board member of the Project for Public Spaces for 20 years, Michael has worked with the top names in architecture, design, and food, and is the recipient of Food Arts Silver Spoon Award. He is the New York editor of the new tome, 1001 Restaurants to Experience Before You Die, for which he wrote the foreword. And we forgot to applaud for Jacqueline, David, and Michael, so a round of applause. Welcome to all of you. Okay, now the fun begins. In a couple of minutes, I'm not going to be necessary at all because I know our panelists are just going to start talking among themselves, which is great. But let's start with this. I know that many people in the audience today are entranced with the food world and would like to be part of it. 
How did you get started? If we can just go down the line, Drew, just a sentence or two. Um, well, I grew up here in uh, uh, lower Manhattan, Peter Cooper, Stuyvesant Town. And my, f my mother was an actress in radio before television. And my father worked for the State Liquor Authority, which licenses restaurants. So he had a way of taking the applications from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile, <laughs> which those people were very appreciative. And they would all invite us as a family to eat in this restaurant, these restaurants on the arm. So at a very early age, in the early 60s, I was exposed to this amazing theatricality of food and restaurants. And I guess from a very early moment, I realized that this is what I wanted to do and I pursued it really from that moment. Lucky to have a great education at Stuyvesant High School and then parlay that into a place called the Cornell School of Hotel Administration. But then the rest begins where, you know, it's called the School of Hard Knocks. It's real experience in order to get involved. Wonderful. Uh, I um, uh, sort of, I wouldn't say I stumbled into my, my, my food writing career, but I, I grew up overseas. Uh, my, my father was a, a diplomat, and I have not just my actor brother, but another brother, and we're all very large <laughs> characters. And I think to keep us in line and to sort of, uh, sort of calm us down when we were living in these countries, many of them in Asia, uh, elsewhere, my parents would take us out to eat. So we experienced this sort of broad palate and we were quite, quite ravenous. And so I've always liked to eat, and I, I, I'm a professional magazine journalist by trade, uh, but uh, you know, if you're a magazine journalist, you usually work contract to contract, and I've written for many, many different publications. And uh, more and more as I wrote, uh, food crept into the, 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 the various topics. I used to write a, a column, a diary column for the New York Observer, there was food in there. And uh, one of my old editors was at New York and asked me, uh, the August Gail Green, who we were just talking about, uh, was retiring at, 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 in, the, in 2000, and they were looking for somebody to replace her. And this, the, my editor friend asked me if I'd like to take a shot. I'd, I'd never really thought about it, actually. Uh, but uh, I did, and uh, here I am. I got my degree in acting for the stage and playwriting, and I did that for a very long time. Um, but simultaneously, like Roseanne said, I've been on the gluten-free thing for over 20 years, so I sort of predated the big trend we have going on with my skills and my sort of knowledge. And there came a point when, you know, you could write for the internet and make money, and that was more consistent than acting, and so I started writing anything for the internet and then used my skills with the gluten-free baking thing into blogging for the internet. Um, sorry into blogging for the internet, and then realized very quickly that I didn't want to be a, just a food blogger, a recipe blogger. I was working for a gluten-free magazine, and I knew that that would not keep me happy. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. Uh, for a very long time, so I sort of put the things that I loved about playwriting, uh, working with stories, working with people, and my history with food and my skills with food, and decided to just write about chefs. And so I made a very conscientious decision to start pitching pieces about chefs. Um, I don't call myself a food writer, I call myself a chef writer. And uh, I've carved a little niche for myself and that sort of helped me get other work with other editors and be able to freelance and be known that I've worked with 200 chefs in New York City and I've worked with many around the world now. Um, I'm very lucky and so yeah, I write stories about chefs. Thank you. I grew up with a, um, a real foodie dad in the suburbs of New York in the 1950s. I now call him the Ur foodie And uh, the other kids were helping Dad fix the car, and I was helping Dad fix Lobster Fra Diablo every weekend. Um, sit down Friday night, figure out what we're going to eat this weekend, where we're going to shop. We'll go to a restaurant, which, you know, that was my life. Um, he also, um, he even had a restaurant for a while in New York, uh, which failed. Um, he also was a great arts guy. So when I came to be of uh, getting a job age, I said, I don't want to be in the restaurant business. It looks too hard. My dad would come home every night and I would have to massage his feet. He was in so much pain. Um, but arts, all right. So I went off and got a doctorate in uh, theater, which was a great love of mine and still is. We're both theater people, I guess. And um, I was teaching um, theater at Skidmore College uh, about 30 years ago. 
and uh, got the opportunity to teach some cooking classes downtown, nothing to do with the college, and discovered, oh my God, I love teaching cooking classes more than I love teaching theater history. So uh, I left the next year, I came to New York, started to write articles, and um, in short order, I was definitely making more money than a college professor did then. <laughs> so that was sort of my path. <clears throat> Uh, my path is, is similar to yours, although um, it, it has some more deviations. Uh, I'd, I'd like to blame it on my mother, uh, who was an avid home cook when I was growing up. And um, we'd like to say that I thought my mother was the best cook in the world until I joined the Army. <laughs> After I got out of the Army, this is true. Uh, after I, I got out of the Army, I was doing graduate work in economics at the new school here, and uh, I needed to support myself, and I got hired by a, a publisher of retail trade magazines, and uh, along the way there, they asked me if I would start a restaurant business newspaper for them, uh, which still exists. It's called Nation's Restaurant News, and it's the, the largest publication in its field. And um, you can see the indirection we have here because we've gone from mothers to the army to graduate work in economics to journalism. Uh, uh, along the way, uh, my late partner uh, got a contract to plan all of the restaurants in the World Trade Center. This is in the 1971. Uh, and was looking for a consultant to work with him. Uh, so uh, we formed a company and uh, we created and operated all of the restaurants in the World Trader Trade Center, including Windows on the World. Uh, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, let's get started. Today is about the present and the future, but just for one moment, can you each tell me which was the most important restaurant to you in the past? Because I think we're gonna make some connections about that and today and what's coming. So you don't have to do it in order, but anyone can just scream out, the restaurant that meant the most to me growing up was, and then maybe tell us why. The Four Seasons. Why? I'd rather have a glass of water in the Four Seasons than a steak dinner or a truffle risotto anywhere. Wow. Uh, it is the quintessential New York restaurant. It's one of a kind because uh, it shows what God would do if he had enough money. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it, it is an, it's an extraordinary piece of urban architecture uh, that uh, has, has woven itself into the fabric of the city. And if you had to choose a quint quintessential New York restaurant, especially a grand one, uh, I would choose that one. Thank you. Um, my dad didn't uh, take us to the Four Seasons, I'm afraid, but uh, we did a lot of great ethnic restaurants, even back in the 50s and 60s. There was a, a Neapolitan chef on Flatbush Avenue, his name was Angelo, the restaurant was Angelo's. Probably, we'd be very lucky if anybody here had ever heard of it, but it is still, is that applause? <laughs> when did? Flatbush and where? <laughs> Come on, I was six years old, I don't know. But um, that, that is still my greatest dining memory ever. It could have been me, could have been the time, but that man was so on top of that, you know, lasagna, linguine, clam sauce, whatever it was. But there's a couple others in my growing up that you also probably don't know, but there was a, a chef from Goa named Oswald who had something called India Pavilion, and that just turned me on to that whole part of the world. And then there was a chef from uh, Chengdu in Brooklyn in the 1970s. His name was Jimmy, and that's all I can remember, but he was way <laughs> down by the Marine Parkway Bridge. And wow, he used to say, yeah, well, I take a little of this fermented rice and I put it in the Szechuan shrimp. It's like, oh my God. So those ethnic backgrounds for me. But let me just tell you one more that I think of the last 20 years, um, I think a very influential restaurant in New York, and it's never had great food, uh, is Balthazar. Uh, it sort of showed uh, you know, the restaurant as community as it is so often in France. And I just have to tell you this great story. A couple of years ago, I was talking to my friend, Jean-Yves uh, Schillinger, who was in New York in the 1990s for a while, but he's back in uh, Colmar. And I said, so what, what are you doing next, Jean-Yves? He said, well, I'm about to open uh, a, a brasserie in Colmar. And I said, really, do you have any models in mind for this brasserie? He said, oh, yes, of course, I'm going to model it after the best brasserie in the world. Now, you know, Comar is where the brasserie was born. And I'm thinking, what's he gonna say? I said, well, Boffinger, what's, what's the best brasserie in the world? Said, of course, uh, Balthazar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I have to pass on this one because when I was growing up, um, <laughs> I watched people eat because you couldn't get gluten-free food and dairy-free food and processed free food. So I went to restaurants with my family and I sat there and I watched. Um, so the world has changed a lot in 20 years since I was eating as a kid. Uh, uh, restaurants. Um, Just one that we're talking about childhood, right? Don't yeah. We? Uh, well, there's sort of two uh, very quickly. Uh, we lived, I lived for quite a long time in Hong Kong as a kid. And Hong Kong's uh, full of all sorts of delicious food, obviously a lot of it Cantonese. Uh, but there was this restaurant called uh, the Repulse, it's a restaurant at the Repulse Bay Hotel, which is a grand old colonial hotel. And we used to go there occasionally on Sundays. It was a classic uh, f continental white tablecloth, stick tartare, all the, all the sort of magical pageantry of the, the sort of the Western restaurant that I had never experienced really. So that was fabulous. They tore it down and then they built it again and they tried to reproduce it, being Hong Kong, and it, it's a complete disaster, but <laughs> then it was beautiful. And then when we used to come back to the States, my family lived in New York, they're old New Yorkers, and my grandfather would take me to uh, the Oyster Bar at Grand Central Terminal. And I thought then, and I actually still think now, that it is sort of the essential f sort of New York dining spot it's a it's a he always he'd always eat it eat at the bar not at the counter he always had a certain he, he used to have the oyster pan roast but it's sort of this this bustling alive it just reeks with this sort of sort of bustling new york terroir so i say he used to go there in his fedora hat so when i moved to new york the first thing i did is i bought a fedora hat and went right up <laughs> so anyway, those are those are probably the two thank you Andrew? I, I have quite a few but um i got to chime in on the chinese restaurants because, you know, all good Jews need to have great Chinese food. So I remember there was a restaurant called China Song right next to the Ed Sullivan Theater. And the, the owner was a friend of my father's, again, because we never went any, any place where we had to pay. And uh, <laughs> obviously, I remember the night that the Beatles played at the Ed Sullivan Theater. We were right next door. It was, it was manic. Um, but I mean, what a revelation to a young person, an egg roll. I mean, come on. <laughs> and, and, and I remember my father, you know, when he'd come home with takeout, it was like insane. So, you know, the Chinese thing. There was a restaurant called Headquarters, where it was the ex-chef of Eisenhower. And uh, they had this, like, big mural of World War II on, on one of the walls. <laughs> and they, I, I remember they... Military-themed I swear, well, you know, Johnny Schwartz. <laughs> How did that do? Uh, the guy's name was Johnny Schwartz and uh, Charlie Fodor. There were two guys. They used to have, you know, like at Yankee Stadium where they come around with the hot dogs and that big metal container. So they used to pass garlic bread all around the dining room. It was it really, it was sensational, you know, free garlic bread. And then I think they had something on the menu, LBJ's Delight, which was like a, a you know, a frozen seafood cocktail with Russian dressing or something like that. <laughs> and then um, now, then, but I, I don't want to give you the wrong impression because I really uh, learned from some amazing places. There were French restaurants like uh, uh, La Marique and Café Argenteuil, where they had all come off the family tree of uh, Henri Soule and Le Pavillon. And of course, I mean, La Côte Basque was one of the most spectacular New York restaurants in both its look and its, you know, it, it, it really did change a lot of things in New York City. Jean-Jacques Rechou. Yes, David. That, just one quick thing I want to add to the Drew's um, China song. My dad's favorite restaurant in New York in that era was um, House of Chan, which was right nearby that. Right. And uh, when, as we evolved in New York, I took him to a Hunan restaurant. He said, oh, it's good. It's not House of Chan. Then I took him to a Shanghai restaurant. It's good. It's not House of Chan. I finally, in the late 90s, had a chance to take him to China. And we're in Canton. And we're eating the great food. And I said, Dad, how is it? And he said... It's, okay. it's not House of Jam. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering, there's so much power on this panel. I'm wondering if everyone should just move their microphones like two inches uh, in front of them. Because two inches. We're getting a little reverb and... Um, I think maybe it's that think? microphone I think right that's there. that one's closed. Yeah, it's the take, Rogue. Take that one away. The Rogue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can so we? that was fascinating. Mm. Uh, for another reason, I just want to say that my uncle's favorite restaurant was China Song. Uh -oh. He was a musician on Broadway, and he was a bit of an alcoholic, and he used to go there every uh, night to drink after the uh, shows were over, around midnight, with his dog roulette, who used to be on the bar, this little white poodle. Okay, so um, the name of this conference is Gotham on a Plate. So here's a very, very important question for our amazing panelists. Here it goes. Is there a New York cuisine that makes it different from others? I say absolutely not. I mean, uh, it used to be a joke 
that, uh, you know, what, what, what could you conjure up as New York? Um, but today, uh, well, actually, it happened a while back. If you really looked at what Wildy Maloof and even I think, Michael, you were probably involved with the Hudson River Club, the idea of, of products from New York and the Hudson Valley, now that makes sense. Does it really evolve to the point of it being a New York cuisine? I really don't think so. Um, but we, we have to think of, in the last 30 years, there wasn't any, any respectability for American cuisine. Because I remember when Larry Forgione opened an American place, um, you know, at the bottom of the menu, he had petit four. You know, so he still couldn't get outside the realm, uh, or it was called prefix menu, for instance, you know. So they still were playing the French restaurant game uh, now, the great news is that, you know, uh, we all accept American cuisine and its regionality, but I, I, unless we call something Hudson Valley, I, I don't get New, I don't see New York cuisine. I think there's a definite, these days, um, there's certainly a New York taste. There's certainly a New York, uh, the sort of, and I think that the, the New York diners have evolved over time. I mean, the, the older generation, uh, New Yorkers were used to eating elaborate, fancy foods from other places. Often, uh, this food was explained to them by people with funny accents and bow ties, right? That doesn't happen anymore so much. That, that, that there's a, there's a new, the, and, 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 and so the story of the last decade or so is that, that that world has sort of disappeared and the, really the cooks and the kitchen slaves, and you probably agree with me, <laughs> Have, there's been a revolution, and they've come to the front of the house, and they basically stormed it and taken over. Most of the, obviously, the trendy restaurants in New York, the kitchen is really like the stage. It's right in front of you. You're eating at a bar. You're eating the foods that the cooks used to eat furtively in the back, the <laughs> porks, the burgers, those things, the very heavy flavored, heavy umami food. And, you know, the, their various, uh, you know, David Chang is obvious, ob obviously, uh, you know, one of the masters of this revolution, uh, Mario Batali, to a certain extent, he took the music that they used to like to listen to in the kitchen and, you know, Led Zeppelin and, and blasted it out over the, the, the sort of cowering heads of his patrons. But I think that they developed a New York style and a New York taste, which these days is much imitated around the world. And it's this two-fisted, umami, very, quite fusion-y, if you talk to Chang. April Bloomfield's another one. Uh, you know, it's just this, it's this, uh, it's a, it's almost like New York music, it's, it's a certain kind of music, and people, you know, the, the, a lot of comparisons between music and food these days, especially uh, with, among the millennial generation, and I think there's a, de you, you could say there's a very, there's a very New York sound, and I don't think there was before, so I would say yes, there is a New York cuisine. Wow. Yeah, I use the term New York City cuisine a lot, not a lot, a lot, but like enough, um, because I think for, there are a lot of chefs who are first generation American now and we have cultures, you know, embodied from Europe and from South America and from Africa and I, I see a lot of chefs that I work with who are American, but they, they even though they're cooking American food or American menus, you know, the term global influences gets thrown by publicists a lot. It's an American menu with global influences and so, um, New York City, we're so diverse, we're this melting pot, it's the same thing with music, it's the same thing with art and culture. We're sort of everything, so to me, whether it's new or not, I don't know, but to me, New York City cuisine is sort of what fusion is everywhere else. Like, it's fusion, I'm a New Yorker, so it's like everywhere else they've got fusion, we have New York City cuisine, because we are everything. Um, we can be American, and we can throw in flavors from around the world, and to me, that's what New York City cuisine is, and why uh, a lot of really good restaurants can succeed here. Also, conspicuously, uh, New York, I think, makes the fashion these days. In the, in the dining world. I mean, you guys can disagree with me, but I think for a certain, you know, because of the internet, because of the sort of free-flowing uh, sort of blizzard of information, New York is more and more, chefs don't have to come to New York to make their reputations, but they certainly have to know what's going on in New York to make their reputations. It used to be they'd have to come here. Now coming here is too much of a hassle. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> no. um, but, you know, New York is, you know, I just got back from Paris. Paris is not the fashion center of uh, the modern restaurant scene anymore. Far from it, in fact. And it's actually, if you're a New Yorker who's marinated in this endless bombardment of, you know, pork buns and burger, the, Paris is actually a relief. You know, it's just, a, it's just calm, it's settled, it's old, 
And yeah. it's just that everything goes according to this sort of mannered style where in New York is just people are just obsessed with fashions and trends and you know, blogs and uh, I, so. Yeah. I agree with that, but uh, for the overall question, um, I agree with Drew. I, you know, I think there are many little arguments you could make about what is New York food, what's become New York food, but for the most part, I think it's a bunch of New Yorkers looking for some kind of self-validation. Uh, you could take almost any major city in the world today and make the same kind of argument. You know, those San Francisco, we started this whole thing. You know, what, whatever. I don't see a New York taste. I know Adam spoke to that. I'd love to hear more from you later about what you think that is exactly. But, uh, you know, think of a city like Rome. Think of a city like Lyon. Those cities have a real taste and a real food attitude and have had for hundreds of years. If there's an American city that I think has a real food culture, I bet you're all thinking what I'm about to say, but I always send Europeans who are looking for that to New Orleans. To me, that's where, say what you will about whether it's good or bad these days or whatever, but that's where the food really came from the ground up. We have a lot of special things in New York. We have our New York style of pizza. We have the Carnegie Deli. You know, we have all these kinds of things, but I think that they're little particular particularities that don't add up to you know, a New York taste. And I would just say that all of the the many, many restaurants we have now of very good quality that are doing kind of modern, you know, neo-bistro, what they call in Paris, kind of food, I get that food everywhere in the world. I see more similarities than differences between Sydney and San Francisco and Honolulu and New York and Paris and Milan, and Michael does too. <laughs> Blame the internet. Um, I'd like to divide the answer into two parts. Uh, one is uh, New York cuisine, which is what you asked about, uh, and the other is a New York restaurant, which is something quite different. Um, and, and if you go back 40 years, uh, we used to uh, debate quite often, uh, was there a, a West Coast manner of cooking and was there an East Coast manner of cooking? Or was there a West Coast restaurant style and an East Coast restaurant style? And, and 40 years ago, there was, because 40 years ago, uh, the French stranglehold on fine dining in New York was beginning to crumble, uh, while in California, where they didn't speak French at all, uh, they were reveling in things like fresh vegetables, uh, and, which we weren't. Uh, we used to joke that uh, the difference between New York and California is our vegetables were four days older than theirs. <laughs> uh, so there, there is that distinction that no longer is true because you now get everything from anywhere by FedEx and air freight and uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether your bronzino was farmed in the Mediterranean or whether your uh, salmon was farmed in Chile, it gets here, um, it gets to Las Vegas in the same amount of time. Uh, but there was also a difference in attitude which I think evolved. Um, and uh, it, it took New York a long time before it learned to take its clothes off. Uh, and by that I mean in California, uh, they didn't wear jackets, they didn't wear ties, they didn't get dressed up the way we get dressed up to go to dinner 40 years ago. Uh, it was a completely different environment. And um, I guess California and leisure overcame uh, New York and its business formality so that um, now having to put a jacket on to go to a restaurant is, is a rarity. Well, I, I just want to jump in briefly to say that that's what's really important is the change in formality um, because restaurants by and large were facades in many ways there to trick you. And one of the tricks was you had to get dressed up to go because the theory was you're keeping out the riffraff and part of that trick was charging you or, you know, there, there's the routine of, you know, I think it still happens in some restaurants in the West Village where the menu, there's not an entree over $18, and they come to the table and they read this litany of specials, and then when you get the bill, everything's $32 or more. You know, it's just a routine. Um, the symbolic change for me was Wolfgang Puck, because he swapped the toque blanche. You know, he worked at a place called Ma Maison. He worked for a restaurateur named Claude Terrai, who's the uh, prodigy of Patrick Terrai, La Tour d'Argent in Paris. And what did he do? He swapped the toque blanche for a baseball hat. He opened the kitchen and he put smoked salmon on a pizza. Oh my God. <laughs> so, but that resonated and that was like 1983, 
In California. In California. It resonated. Okay. Michael McCarty was doing it for a long time. He's still around, by the way. But I, I remember vividly, um, I had just run the New York Marathon. I know that's hard to believe. And <laughs> I, I was on the West Coast, and I did this whirlwind trip um, on the West Coast to all these restaurants. And when I came back, guess what? I was going to open a restaurant, and it was going to be called the Silverado Trail. That restaurant, one night, I'm working at La Grenouille, and somebody ordered like the most expensive bottle of wine, Morache. And as I'm pouring it, it was like God was talking to me. I saw this gorgeous green gold color coming out of the bottle. I looked at the label, Morache. They'll spend a lot of money. And then I opened a restaurant in Tribeca and charged $16 for three courses with David Boulay. How about that? The, I, I didn't rip anybody off. $16. <laughs> so I, I'd just like to f finish my, uh, my scholarly evaluation. <laughs> uh, but, but you're right. Uh, the, uh, if I had to describe a difference between the West Coast and the East Coast today, it would not be the food. Um, it would be the density of restaurants because real estate here is, uh, is so expensive and the cost of building is so expensive that uh, no matter where you are, you're, you're, you're sitting in uh, urban density uh, surroundings compared to California where there's more room to spread out. So uh, dining in New York has a more intense feel throughout, the, throughout an entire meal compared to the West Coast. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Roseanne, yes, may I just David. point out that during uh, Brian Miller's uh, tenure as restaurant critic of the Times, you probably all recall this, he, they sent him to California for a week to write a piece about California restaurants. He came back and said that the most important difference was that in California, all the main courses are garnished with fruit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was true for a while. I'd like to add that, I, I, Drew, I'd like to add that the, uh, the very concept of the Hudson River Club uh, belongs to the woman uh, to your right who uh, created the idea in the first place. Okay. Thank you, Michael. That's what husbands sometimes do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to leave it up to the audience whether or not there is or isn't a New York cuisine. So now we're going to move on to the next question. I'm already feeling frustrated because we could be here, this group, you know, for two days. But I believe that everyone really will want to know through your eyes, because we're lucky enough to have a consultant, a writer, a critic, a restaurateur. We've got everyone on this panel uh, to know what some of the coming trends are. What's out there? What do you love? What don't you love? What's coming on the horizon? And you can ask, answer in a variety of ways. Adam, you can tell us what the best thing you had recently was or the worst thing. Jackie, you could tell us who you're interviewing. David, you can tell us what people want to read in your newsletter. And Michael, you can say anything you want to. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about trends, what's on the horizon, what's exciting. Am I up? Am I up? Oh, yeah, he, yeah. Keeps yeah. he keeps no, tapping I, I wanna, me. He's tapping on the shoulders like, no, because I, I don't know. I, I want to I wanna go last. I want to go last. No, I want to go last. He wants to go last. <laughs> Who, well, you go I think the thing, well, the, the, I, 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 you know, there are a lot of trends, sort of, I guess. Um, I think the thing about this job that I do now from when I started it, when I started it, the trends were easily identifiable, uh, somewhat. Uh, many of them were classically based. Now they're not. And now, I mean, the, the, old, the old saw is that they're more, you know, there are still, um, critics used to, and diners used to cluster around the multi-star restaurants, the three, four, whatever, whatever your system is. Uh, and those, uh, there are less and less of those, as Drew can attest. Absolutely. And there are more and more two one-star restaurants uh, that are all off in God knows where, singing their own tune. So it's a, it's a, and this is part of it's a demo, part of it's the internet, part of it's uh, what I was talking about, the sort of uh, kitchen slave revolution. Uh, chefs are opening places all over the place, not just in New York, all over the country, uh, and doing all sorts of different interesting things. And you can, the, and the, the, what's happened simultaneously with that, in the 90s was this all quite settled, there are many superstar chefs we can identify, we all know their names. Then in, along came the internet, and the, th the hunger, the thirst for uh, food-related information has only increased by about 5,000 percent. I mean, the f food has moved to the center of the culture, whereas before it was sort of on the side. And ironically, the superstar chefs have disappeared. But there's, so you've had to create them to a certain extent. I think 
the superstar chefs today would agree with that. I think if you talk to, say, Chang, he would agree. It's like, a, I don't know what happened. I don't, I'm a superstar. What, what happened? <laughs> and a lot of that is uh, the appetite for uh, anything that has to do with that world. Uh, a lot of it has, a lot of it has to, you know, Anthony Bourdain. I mean, the cooks became sexy rock stars. So uh, there's a lot of people out there living that dream and it's harder and harder to identify the trends. So there are a lot of them, you know, the obvious trends. Uh, the gourmet restaurants, quote unquote gourmet, has sort of downscaled to little tasting rooms. That's been going on for a while. That's not gonna change. Certainly in this city that won't change for, because for economic reasons, it's not gonna change. Um, the comfort food revolution, just to my chagrin, just keeps on rolling, you know? <laughs> A burger, a hot dog, yeah. a pig in a blanket. Yeah. 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 It just you. keeps on going. A lot of that is, again, the, the appetite on the part of the audience for that kind of food, because that's what, that's what they like to eat. Yeah. I, I, this you. question always kind of pains me and puzzles me. What are the trends? Because I feel like it's 20 years now that we're being asked that question, and we're giving the same answers all the time. It's like, you know, it's, I remember talking to Michael Lamonaco back when I was reviewing for Gravain. And I said, Michael, why did you put 15 things on the plate? He said, because the bridge and tunnel crowd wants it. Um, but me, I just want to roast chicken. I mean, chefs have been saying that for like 25 years now in the U.S. But they are roasting chicken. And they are. I mean, it's roast chicken. You're right. So if you wanted one right. trend, mm. okay. roast chicken. Okay. Yeah, but not right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, but, yeah. Now you can, but now you can but, pay, but now first you pay $80 for it for two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You're going to pay right. more than $80 for right. it. Building the chicken. Right. I had a roast chicken uh, two months ago in, uh, in Bone in France. You know what it cost? Two people, roast chicken on a spit. It was fabulous, 107 euros. That was wow. it. I mean, it was incredible. But, um, but anyway, That's a lot right, of money but, but for this a chicken. is exactly my point. We, we're always saying stuff like this. And I'm not sure. Yes, yes, of course, Adam's right. There's all kinds of little things you can identify as trends. But overall, the big arc, I have one thing that for me has been the big arc. Um, and it's not something that anybody talks about, but I think it's something that's happening. And you know, from the beginning of this, this movement in America, this greening of America, whatever, I've always said, you know, it's great that we now know about all kinds of things, we, the populace that we didn't know about before. I remember back in the late 60s, early 70s, I was cooking every Saturday night for a group of friends who were at Harvard, and um, so they're very educated, upscale people, and um, every Saturday night I'd try to make something different. I remember saying things like, this Saturday night I'm gonna make moussaka, and they said, what is that? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it, that just keeps growing. Every, now everybody thinks they know what moussaka is. Um, but I think what I've always tried to insist in my TV show and my books, it's not good enough just to know that it exists. You have to know what's good about it. You know, what's a good version of this? And when I wrote about risotto, for example, in one of my cookbooks, I showed pictures of different risotti. This is a bad one. This is a kind of bad one. This is, and I think that movement towards uh, criteria for quality, I think that's growing. And I think that's going to grow. I think it, it may be the case that a lot more Americans now know about various ethnic dishes of the world. But I hope we're heading in the direction where they not only know it, they know if it's good or bad. <laughs> uh, the I thought you were going last. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you go last. You're the most experienced. No, no, go ahead. Um, the, I get a lot of calls from journalists uh, asking this very question. Uh, and the most frequent question that I've been asked this year by journalists, so this is a journalistic trend, not a gastronomic trend, is uh, what's the future of crickets? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to know and write an article about or do a morning TV show about crickets and other insects that uh, are being played with as an alternate form of protein. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you want a rule of thumb, four legs is good, six legs is someday <laughs> going to be better. Um, and, but it, 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 it is a serious question that has to do with uh, other developments that are going on in protein, raising uh, beef in, in a lab from uh, tissue culture, uh, hand-printed food, uh, I mean, 3D-printed food, um, alternate proteins from things like seaweed, which we're all going to have to grapple with someday when we get old. Um, well, you will. Uh, 
the, on the other hand, uh, I, th I think the big changes in the restaurant industry and in the food business have to do with technology uh, rather than what's being put on the plate. Uh, and this is something that's fairly invisible because you don't really think about it. Uh, uh, you make your reservations on your smartphone. 40% uh, of the people will sit down in a restaurant tonight, sit down in a restaurant tonight, uh, made a reservation on a mobile device. Uh, and, and that's just a very simple example. Uh, Starbucks, you go to Starbucks, you can order and you can pay with your mobile device, that's easy. Uh, but later this year, uh, you will also be able to order your coffee on a mobile device and pick it up directly because you paid for it already and buck the line. And later this year, you can put a standing order into Starbucks so that it'll deliver coffee or coffee end to your house or to your office or wherever you are, all off this mobile device. Um, and so I, I, looking ahead, I say, well, what, what would happen if Google or Amazon uh, decided they wanted to play in our sandbox? Uh, and the, the answer, of course, is that they already are. Uh, but picture a day when uh, we'll use Amazon food, uh, at, for example, which doesn't exist yet. Uh, suppose uh, it gave you the options in your city or your neighborhood to order whatever you wanted to. Um, now, in New York right now, you can go to menu pages and you can look up all the restaurants in your neighborhood and you can call and order if you want to, and some of them you can do online. But suppose Amazon did it another way. Suppose they had a category called rotisserie chicken and another category called barbecued ribs or another category called pizza. Um, and now you're looking at options from a dozen restaurants, from uh, nearby supermarkets, from uh, gourmet shops, uh, all of whom could deliver to you. But at, as a restaurateur, I look at this and I say, they've just disintegrated my menu. Uh, and I use the word disintegrated uh, on purpose. Uh, they've disintegrated my menu because I don't know what my menu should look like now. Uh, online, when you're ordering from me, uh, I'm, I'm in the barbecued spare ribs category, but I also have chicken and all this other stuff, and how do I know she negotiate that? So I see big data uh, and big players like Amazon and Google uh, disrupting what, uh, what a restaurant is and, and how it works. This is pretty Thank profound you. stuff. Thank you, Michael. We have Jacqueline and Drew, and then we're gonna ask one or two more questions, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. I just wish we had all day. Jacqueline, trends. Um, I'm lucky that I don't write about trends. And uh, being a gluten-free person, I'm glad that I'm sort of not part of that trend anymore. But um, I guess on a, like a very general scale, like I, I'm personally done with avocado toast. I'm personally done with cauliflower <laughs> being the new kale, um, things like that. But at least they are there's healthier food, there's better quality food at lower price points, so that you don't have to go to, you know, the five, four, even three-star restaurants to get um, sustainably raised protein. You can get more forms of protein. You can get smaller portions of protein. You can get more vegetables. Um, so as somebody who has always needed to eat that way and somebody who works with chefs who are trying to put more healthful products out for their diners, like I hope that that is a trend. Just as we're you know, concerned about global warming, I hope that our concern for our food and where it comes from is a trend that you know, continues to go further, for lack of a better word, calling it a trend. Um, yeah, I mean, I think vegetables, <clears throat> you're gonna say one thing, but the, the fancy, the, 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 like the, the, the sort of top chefs in New York are, I think vegetables. That's, I mean, they're, they're sort of weary of the... Nothing. Yeah, they're, we, they're okay. weird. There yeah, could be worse trends to have No, they're, it's, a, it's, all, it's a good trend, but they're weary of the, the Before pork we bun. wrap this up with Drew, could I just say one quick thing well, about good. cost in this issue of cost that we're touching on. There's a dish at um, Milos, which I thought was murdered the other day in the New York Times. I, I didn't think it was a fair review. It didn't tell me enough detail why that place only got one side. But anyway, you know the stacked vegetables in yes. Milos, which is fabulous. Right. The fried, Milo's, Milo's special, eggplant, zucchini, thin slices, lightly battered, stacked on a plate, a little uh, tzatziki underneath. It's heaven, everybody who goes there orders it, despite the fact that it costs $30. It probably costs 30 cents in food costs. Why should that cost $30? Because. So I once, well, there is a reason. No, I, I complained once to Costas, who owns the place, and he's in New York occasionally, he said, okay, let me show you something. He takes me back into the kitchen, and there are two chefs there making this dish. He said, you see those two chefs? This is their job. They make that dish 
full time. That's all they do. That's why I have to charge a lot of money for it because it's always perfect. So you know, sometimes it makes sense when people have to charge money. I'm Wonderful. Uh, sympathetic to you, the rest of the tour. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your sympathies. Drew. Uh, the only thing I was going to say is I hate the word. I, I hate. Uh, well, Drew, can I just because I really want to hear this. Yeah. Uh, so forgive forgive me, everyone, for the word. But we were talking before about things that are just maybe changing rather right. than trends. So the, the role of the restaurateur versus the chef. Well, I, um, I, I, I'll, the, the, I'll definitely the, jump know, into that, okay. uh, yes. Rose. Uh, the only thing I was going to say here was, um, you know, one chef in Spain will create something magnificent, which is unique to that little part of Spain. And he's got like 50 people cooking for 40 persons. But the influence of it is magnificent. There's only one problem. Not everyone can recreate steel, you know, Xerox. And so it seems to me there's like an alleyway someplace in New York where all the chefs get together and they say, we're all going to buy the same plates and we're going to plate the food to the left. And we're going to make it, we're going to use tweezers when we do that so it looks absolutely perfect. Then we're going to invite our journalist friends to take photographs of this so that will keep uh, you know, expanding the stupidity of, <laughs> of the small to the left uh, and ugly plates. What I would say is that I love pizza. I remember when it was a nickel. Uh, I love tacos. The, the taco king in New York is about to do an 18 course taco thing. Just what we're all looking for. Let's sit down and eat like tortillas 18 different times. The ramen thing is absolutely ridiculous. It used to cost 39 cents, and you did it when you were stoned at college. <laughs> and I have, I admit this, I've succumbed to the hamburger thing because I was asked by, uh, this is always, this, is, this leads into your question, the restaurateur versus the chef. Okay, restaurateurs are extinct. You hear that sound? Those, those are dinosaurs. We've left with the dinosaurs. But there's a handful of us left. So at Madison Square Garden, they wanted to transform the garden by spending a billion dollars, and part of that was to change the food. So they brought in John George von Gerichten to do what? Chicken. They brought in Andrew Carmelini to do what? Sausages. And they had asked me what I wanted to do, and I wanted to do anything but hamburgers. But they say, you got the hamburgers. <laughs> so I said, I, I feel like I'm about to be like Lewis Black here. I didn't want to do the hamburgers, you know. <laughs> I worked at McDonald's in 1972. I know what, I, you know. So, um, but here's what I did. The non-chef, the restaurateur. I said, fuck it. I'm going to make a great hamburger. And I broke it down. And I'm not going to hype it right here. When you go see Billy Joe for the hundredth time, or you see the losing Knicks, or the Stanley Cup bound Rangers, check out. Rangers. It's, it, it, it's like no hamburger you ever ate. And guess what? After a career of over 30 years, I own Nobu for crying out loud. After 30 years, I get stopped, and I go, you know, your hamburger at Madison Square Garden is unbelievable. You know, like that's my claim to fame so now. So when's the burger restaurant opening? Well, you see, that, you see that I, I, I grew up in the 60s. And what was the mantra? Don't sell out. So I worked, I, I'm in the restaurant business. I've made a fair share of money, but I don't think I've ever done anything untoward in terms of selling out. Like, you're not going to see me in a Lexus commercial. What is not so that they would want me. selling out about a burger book? Because everyone does it, and it's, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think, I, I think if Hubert Keller does it in Las Vegas, there's a fine line between delicious and selling out. That's okay. really maybe. Adam, I'm sure you're going to show up there soon. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you each like two seconds for a closing remark, maybe six words. It's like poetry. We do this in poetry class. Six words. Michael, let's start with you. Six words. Closing, we're just getting started. Be <laughs> you know what? That was beautiful. David. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard. But I think for me, everything that's going on has to do with television. I think ev the things that we learned the populace in general, in the last 20 years watching food on TV, that's the root of a lot of the problems that we see in restaurants today. <clears throat> also, in, also Instafoodogram in, yeah. New, in New York, you think that's true? Yeah, the TV so We're thing? talking about New York, like, are we talking about New York? We talking about, oh. Well, actually, it's a good question. What, what I mean is that generation that grew up watching the Food Network starting 1995 till now, 
on food, you, on TV, you can't taste the food, which was always a production problem for me. But I think it's a now, now it's a larger problem. People know how food is supposed to look, they know how chefs are supposed to talk, they know what the menu is supposed to say, but they don't know how food is supposed to taste. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline. Along those lines, um, the younger generation of journalists has to be writing better content versus just more Bravo. content. The internet's been around for a while, blogs have been around. I'm tired of seeing the same pieces about the same things and people not doing the work of going and, and eating. Um, I know this is a lot more than six words, but like I think we need to be better at what we're doing and editors are starting to do that and I think the next generation of food writers is going to get better at doing that and maybe circle around to the generations mm -hmm. before us, but um, better journalism, better content. No, I have to I, say I'd it's like, hard to... I think it's getting better. Right, I'd like to I say something better. on behalf of journalists Adam? because okay. I'd like... Uh, what? Fire away. Adam, Go you ahead. have like six words. I got, you know, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank I, you very I much. Think, I think yeah. actually the content of journalism, I mean, the blogs are hired, you know, eaters hired, uh, not one, but three full-time critics. Mm -hmm. When I started, you know, it, it's changed a, a lot. Um, the internet has had a huge effect, obviously, on how we perceive all this stuff, uh, but I think it's maturing and um, I'm hopeful for the future. Hopeful. I think uh, the reason I participate in things like this is to learn something and that the relationship that I've always had is symbiotic, which is if you open a restaurant with your life savings, you need somebody to find that restaurant, discover it, good, bad, or indifferent, but hopefully it's good. And at the same time, they need somebody to write about. And look at this, 30 years later, I'm still around, and they're still around. That means they got it right 90% of the time, <laughs> and I might have gotten it right 75% of the time. There's no such thing as bad publicity, you know. That's that. right. Yeah. Except, when, except when you're out of business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we definitely want to take some questions. I think we have a little time, and maybe, Fabio, if we go over five or ten minutes, because this is such an extraordinary panel. So if you have questions, please come up. I'm sure they would love to talk to you. We have someone coming up right now. Maybe it's a little scary to come up here and talk to these guys. I don't know. And we have someone no, here? Not. Good. Okay. Yeah. There you are. Very easy. I had the pleasure of knowing or working with about a third of your panel. Mm -hmm. And, and including question. noting you. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, as someone who worked in the restaurant industry for about 20 years as a chef, went through all the trends, one of my mentors, I think, was one of your original chefs for Windows in the World, Henri Boubet. Prince Andre Rene. No, Henri Boubet. Oh, yes. Boubet. Boubet. Boubet, yes. One of my gods. Um, he was one of the first chefs, French chefs, to op openly welcome me as a woman into a kitchen where I was one of three women amongst 150 men. And I was the only one not married to another chef. Oh. <laughs> but my question is, now I'm running into these young people who are graduates of some culinary school, <coughs> excuse me, and they're making, opening restaurants and they're opening taco shops or this ethnic restaurant or that, and I say, well, have you been to Mexico? Have you studied, you know, P Patricia Canuata or Diane Kennedy? They say, who is that? Yes. No, I didn't bother to go to Mexico. No, I didn't bother to go to this country or that. Or I'm serving dim sum, but I've never eaten dim sum. <laughs> you all have, hired fantastic chefs through your life who have done many different things just as a guy have. David, you once complained to me that I didn't have your crostini hot enough and I, and I explained to you that the, even though it was you, the Coral Gables Fire Department would not allow me to have a grill in the middle of the bookstore. <laughs> so my question is, would you be hiring and how do you feel about these young people coming up and just opening things uh, that are trendy flavors but they have no background, no education in this. And the other question is, B, I'm a chef who reads. I have always had a major library of cookbooks. I'm one of the few. Why don't chefs read? Ooh, okay, thank you so much. Your first comment is so well taken and really important. I think chefs do read and they sit in bed like the rest of us reading cookbooks. Uh, do you want to comment real quick because we're, short time and we have an, another question or She's two. That's right. Travel. It's so important. <clears throat> yeah, we, we, used, we, we, we used to joke that uh, when, you, when you got out of culinary school, uh, you were capable of chopping parsley without hurting yourself. 
uh, and all the rest you had to learn. Uh, and uh, it was true then, it's, it's true today. Uh, the thing is that you can open up, open up a taco shop now without knowing anything about Mexican food because you can fill it full of things that have nothing to do with Mexico and that will make you a star in no time flat. Things the customers have seen on TV, perhaps. Yeah. No, but I also think, first of all, there aren't a lot of great taco places in New York anyways, yes. right? We all know that. Secondly, we're, and I'm talking about New York here, um, uh, the market will figure itself out. Um, we have, you know, New York has, um, the, new, the new generation of eaters are much more well-informed than the old ones. And if it's a good taco place, uh, it's going to work out. If it's not, it won't. So the market, you know, it's a brutal market and it will still work out whether, you know, if the person doesn't know what they're doing, probably they're not going to be having their taco shop, uh, uh, you know, after yeah, a the, year or so. The, every chef that I, that I interviewed complains about staffing that the kids coming out of culinary school don't know enough and they don't want to work hard enough and the ones that do are going to be the ones that are going to be around 10 years from now. Excellent. Okay, we have another question. Hi, um, sorry about that. I'm sorry, what was your name again? I'm looking directly at you. Michael, David? No, the female Jacqueline. in the middle. Oh, yeah. Jacqueline. Jacqueline, yeah, my question is directed to you. Um, just for my own, I guess, reasons of wanting to grow in your area. Um, what efforts do you put into your blogging? And specifically, what I mean by that is how often do you post? And um, what is the time that you spend in post-production? And what is the difference between the two? Um, I'm very lucky right now that a lot of the pieces that I put on Words Food are, are from research that I'm doing for somebody else. I am the queen of asking too many questions and 12,000 word to 22,000 word transcriptions of interviews and I get maybe a thousand word word count or for the magazine maybe a 1500 word word count and so blogging for me is a way to put out content that I really care about without a filter. Um, so I don't necessarily have, a, I'm gonna post this many things, sometimes it's three in one week, sometimes it's one a month. Mm -hmm. But it's more about, you know, I've got this piece on Israeli cuisine coming out in the magazine. I've got three articles, articles for my website that I can write. Um, I think blogging, because there are so many blogs, it's about being true to what you're passionate about, only writing when you're passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say, like, in general, because now I've got sort of a, a, an energy going, like, I do my first transcription, uh, 22,000 words, I cut it to 12,000 words, I cut it to 6,000 words, probably that 6,000 words is what's going to go on the website not sick, maybe like 4,000 words, and the 2,000 goes to the client, or the 1,000 goes to the client, or the 500 goes to the client. Um, but that work is sort of already done, so it might only take me a half an hour of asking restaurants for photos, or an hour of cleaning up my own photos, so I'm not that great at it. Um, so maybe an hour on things that I put on my blog, but a lot of that work was already done. Uh, I still write very slowly. I still take a lot more time than I'm getting paid to do to write pieces because I'm still learning and I'm still figuring out how to be a better writer. Um, so I'd say there's no, again, content and quality of content is more important than how much you're putting out there as a blogger. See, I think that's yeah. probably, if you're gonna be writing for a, um, so I'll just take Grub Street, which is the New York Magazine blog. I think uh, quality is important, but you better be putting out a lot of content because uh, the internet is like a, a pet shark. It needs to be fed <laughs> con constantly. And the, 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 the great, uh, the, you know, and there's really a whole new generation of journalists, not just in food and everything, uh, very facile, uh, passionate, but usually about one subject, but also they can write about anything. But and there's it, a difference between writing for Grub Street or Eater or Serious Seeds, because know, there's you, a team. If you're doing your own one-person blog that you're just doing yeah, it's true, but that's uh, Andrew Sullivan, I mean, the, the great blogger. I mean, it, it, you know, it's voracious. I mean, I, I admire you. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it's, content is very important. Content is obviously important, but uh, I mean, content is, is the king. I mean, you have, you have to put, put things out at a high rate of speed, I think. You know, Thank you. You, you, you just have to be, keep people engaged. They're like butterflies flying around, you know, or schools of fish. I hope that was helpful. Great yeah. responses from Thank our you. panelists. We have time for one more question, sir. It's you. Hi. Okay. So I want to address the, um, since you're all restaurateurs, restaurant writers and whatnot, um, the, 
you know, the issue with labor costs right now, which seems to be a really hot topic, especially amongst young chefs, um, she addressed the issue that a lot of young cooks coming out of culinary school aren't willing to put in the time and the effort. But as a culinary school graduate and somebody who did put in a lot of time and effort, I can tell you that it was much more lucrative for me to stop going to the school of hard knocks, as you said before, and working the 90 hour weeks late into the night while going to school full time here at the New School as a Food Studies student, after coming out of debt for $36,000 to go to the French Culinary Institute learning how to not chop parsley with cutting yourself. <laughs> it's impossible to continue that lifestyle making $9.50 an hour, $10 an hour, especially living in a city like New York, which is you know where you come to learn the restaurant industry, or traditionally used to, which is why we're seeing chefs returning to their hometowns now, you know, creating new pop-up and restaurants and whatnot like that. Um, but as somebody who is from New York and decided to stay in New York and not leave, um, can you just, you know, as restaurant owners and restaurant writers, can you, do you think that the issue of high rent, high costs of food, and not trickling down to, let's say, your undocumented cooks or your cooks who are, you know, culinary students in debt, do you think that that is kind of going to hurt the New York City restaurants in, in the long run? Yes, it, it, it's totally affected everything. The, the rents right now are ridiculously stupid. Um, I, don't, I think honest people want to pay their employees honest wages. The, the problem is, in you, we, let's just say in earnest, um, if we raise our prices from, let's just say, $50 per person to close to 100 um, that means a tip to a waiter is $15 on the $100, let us just say, instead of $750. So they're getting an immediate raise. You know, you open the restaurant with low prices, Adam Platt gave you a great review, now you can raise your prices. So the waiters do well, but the cooks, right. so, the cooks are still making the same crappy wages. So certain restaurateurs tried to even that out. Guess what? It's against the law. In other words, uh, you could even have a meeting and everyone could agree, we're all going to split the tips. We want it to be everyone making the same amount of money. And it's gotten to the point where as owners of now a business, and by the way, it used to be we, were in, we, we ran restaurants, and now it's, it's the restaurant business because if you don't follow the laws, you're going to get sued. You might get sued in, in a very frivolous manner, but you, all these tip things that you've read about, not one has been adjudicated. Uh, there's not one where you could stand up and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe I didn't do anything wrong, because it's cheaper to settle, because the lawyers who represent you are in the same cahoots with the lawyers who are doing the class actions against you, unfortunately. So does this bode well for somebody making more than well, now it's more than 9.50 an hour, I can assure you. But it's so. up to around 13, 14 an hour, and we're now paying overtime. So, you know, you, you would have actually make close to $20 an hour if you're working the 10-hour day. Plus, you have to take a break, by the way. I mean, there's a million little things that we never had to worry about. Could I just but, bring you my observation from France? Uh, I think your question is really scary, and Drew's agreement is really scary. I think it's really going to end up hurting us. In France, I've been going to France for 40 years, I think the food is in serious decline in France. I've been there five times in the last two years, working on a story about the decline of food in France, and everybody, no, it's true, man, I'm telling you, don't get me started. Next Rosengarten report, I'll be ranting about it. But anyway, talking to a lot of people, uh, they all say, oh, there was a moment, there was a tipping point. It was when we went from 40 hours a week to 30 hours a week. We can't pay the extra 10 hours a week now because uh, it's overtime rates and therefore many, many restaurants that used to chop the onions and make the stock, now they buy a premium. Right. <clears throat> yeah, but also the prices in those restaurants are twice what you would pay yes. in an equivalent restaurant in New York for that very reason. Uh, I, I, I'd like to make a comment if I, if I can. Um, I, the issue between the front of the house and the back of the house, which is something that you touching on, uh, I think uh, in, in the country uh, is something that's rather scandalous. And, uh, and there's a, a big social clash, in my opinion, that will arise if it's not corrected mm -hmm. between the kind of people who are working in the back of the house and the kind of people right. who are working in the house. I mean, I'll have to even house. comment in my experience, I've had to switch from back of the house to front of the house just yes. to be able to, you know, Very go smart from move. line cook to a <laughs> restaurant manager. And I've had to become you know, try to seek out a job at a restaurant chain because I can't, you know, you can't do it in New York anymore. Well, Sir, if you, if you, if, Michael? If, 
I think we really have to stop. I'm so sorry. But yeah. Sarah, I want to get your name because I want you to be on the panel next time we do one. Your question <laughs> spoke volumes. Yeah, Beautiful, intelligent question. But if I can have everyone's attention for one minute, please. Um, we are going to everyone who was born in April, please come up and get a copy of the Rosengarten Report. And I just or want, March or May. <laughs> I just want to thank. I'm so honored that everyone on this panel said yes and gave us their all and did homework to prepare for it. And I just want to thank them so much. And let's give them a great round of applause. And to your Zen.